Hey everyone, and welcome to Identity Crisis, the mad rise of online account opening fraud. My name is Yuri, and I'm Chief Cyber Officer and Co-Founder at Biocatch. We are at an identity crisis point. Um, if you were asking uh, credit card companies and banks a few years ago uh, about account opening fraud, they would say, yeah, it's a kind of a minor inconvenience. That's not their reaction nowadays. Uh, it's getting to be a tidal wave. Um, this is from Gartner a few years ago. Um, you can see things like account takeover fraud, payment fraud. These are the main areas of concern for uh, risk and security management. But there's one thing that tops all of these concerns, and that's new account synthetic or stolen identity fraud. Um, so it is becoming the number one concern um, regarding fraud in financial institutions. Um, another interesting trend is to see what sort of information um, financial uh, criminals are uh, stealing these days. It used to be credit card information. That was the top priority for financial uh, cyber criminals. But now the number one data element is social security number, which is an identity element. And in fact, identity is becoming a commodity. It's traded in the dark web um, and everyone, every American uh, citizen's records uh, have already been stolen several times over. Um, if we can look at this list, for example, you know, it shows all sorts of uh, data breaches. Um, many of those are related to identity. Um, specifically, if we talk about the big credit reference agencies, the big credit bureaus, um, data aggregators that have been hacked over the years, and this fuels this economy of account opening fraud. Now, the industry is fighting back, uh, realizing that, you know, good old KYC, know your customer, is basically dead, uh, and long live next generation data. So it used to be about what you know and matching all of the information about the user, you know, looking at uh, the data that the user provides and seeing that it all stacks and it's uh, what uh, the records show. Um, but now we have additional data to look at. For example, what you have, which is the user resources, uh, what you do, which is your digital footprint and what you are, user behavior, that behavior biometrics. So a couple of examples for each of those categories. Again, historically, this would be KYC data, residence, license information, credit history uh, information. Uh, those type of data points are already in the wrong hands. And uh, when someone, a cyber criminal, is doing account opening fraud, they have access to all of this. Um, so therefore, a lot of uh, financial institutions and other uh, related industries have started to uh, untap additional lines of defense. Starting with device, this has been uh, something that the industry started to uh, adopt uh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, what sort of device are you coming from? What's the reputation of that device? Uh, information about your location, uh, information about your phone and phone line. Um, more recently, what are you doing? So what's your digital footprint? Any kind of social media reputation that you have, email reputation, uh, open source analysis on your identity. And more recently, behavior biometrics. Um, these are different types of analysis. For example, if you're opening an account, you should be familiar with the data that you're providing. It's your own personal information. You should not be familiar with the process of account opening because, hey, you just open an account. A criminal is going to be the opposite. They're going to be very familiar with the process, but not familiar with the data. And that's the sort of, sort of analysis that behavioral biometrics uh, is now providing. So um, behavioral biometrics, you kind of uh, heard about behavioral biometrics before, but more in the context of profiling. So the idea of behavioral biometrics, uh, when it actually uh, started, was to create a profile of a regular user behavior and then watch for anomalies. This is a classic example. Uh, you see someone uh, that uh, logs in and then interacts with their online banking application. What you see on the screen is the person's mouse motion. In, you know, these are several sessions, several pages, but the mouse motion is basically the same. So that's how you create a profile of the regular user behavior. 
you can use uh, keyboard analysis, you can uh, analyze mouse motion. If the user is uh, operating on a mobile device, you're gonna look at accelerometer, gyro, and touch uh, data. The idea is to create a baseline and then watch for anomalies. Like in this specific case, this account was compromised. The user provided the credentials to a criminal, and now the criminal is accessing the account. You're gonna see a very different type of behavior. So now it's not the same mouse motion. There's a strange bump in the center of the motion. And essentially, this is a way for the uh, financial institution, for example, to say, hey, we do see an anomaly based on the profile, based on the uh, baseline that was created. Another use of behavior biometrics is to look for threats. For example, remote access. Um, this is a mobile device. User uh, is interacting on a mobile device. You can see the swipe motions. These are not going to be straight lines. Even if you think that you uh, move straight uh, in a straight line on your mobile device, you, you actually have a small arc. Um, then you see the tabs. Now the tabs are surrounded, you know, the dot uh, is surrounded by a blue circle. That's your finger pressing on the actual uh, touch screen. That's a normal situation for this account. And now this account was compromised with a help desk scam. Hey, we're the help desk, there's something wrong with your uh, account, your bank account, your mobile device, something like that. Uh, we're here you know, to help you. You just have to install something uh, allowing us uh, remote assistance. People fall for that and then install some sort of uh, remote assistant tools, uh, a tool, uh, or maybe uh, like a rogue application. And then the attacker has remote access on their uh, device. This does not look the same. Um, typically the attacker is gonna control that device using a mouse and keyboard. And essentially you're gonna see uh, these long lines, that's mouse motion, not someone actually physically uh, scrolling up and down on the device. And all of the dots, you don't see the blue circle around them because no one's actually touching the screen. It's all, you know, mouse clicks. Uh, beyond that, because of the remote access, there's gonna be some latency. The latency creates some disruptions to hand-eye coordination. And if you have the right system, you can actually spot that and say, okay, we now know that this mobile device is being remotely controlled. Right. Now, if we talk about account opening though, what's the use of behavior biometrics? You cannot really profile anyone. Uh, they're just establishing uh, the account, right? Um, but if you actually look at the way criminals behave, um, you can now analyze second by second what they're doing. Uh, we're gonna start with a very interesting uh, case from one of the top five credit card issuers in the US. Um, they basically give you a credit card online within 30 seconds. You go to the website, you select a credit card, you click apply now, and then you start filling this uh, online form, providing you know your name, uh, email address, date of birth, mobile phone number, uh, address, social security number, and other data points. Essentially, uh, that's what regular users will go through, but also what criminals will go through. So let's actually look at a specific uh, application. Um, the session timeline here, every vertical bar is an interaction, like the user typed something or interacted with the phone. It took one minute and 34 seconds to complete that. And the interesting thing is that the first name was pasted three seconds into the session. Um, that's actually pretty incriminating. You know, why are you pasting your first name? You're supposed to be familiar with it. And the other thing is, how come it's so fast? There's actually a video that will show us how fast it was. So three seconds into the session, already we see control V. It's not autofill, by the way. Uh, someone actually uh, was ready before the application started, uh, form started, uh, went to the application uh, flow, and then used control V to paste something. That's criminal behavior. Um, another thing that was pasted was the social security number, uh, date of birth was also pasted. You know, all of these suggest that whoever is doing this are not really familiar with, um, you know, the personal information, but they're also quite familiar with the process, right? Three seconds and they're beginning to interact. Um, if we look at deposit fraud, that's another interesting uh, trend. So we talked about credit card account opening, of course, a criminal will be interested in that to just get a credit card or a loan or some sort of uh, instant credit. But also deposit fraud uh, is another uh, lucrative uh, type of business because what you do there 
is you open a new account and then you move money from a compromised account that you have. Uh, so let's say that you have money, uh, an account that you've compromised in bank A, you open an account in bank B and say, hey, I'm the user, I wanna open an account, I wanna deposit something from bank A. Um, typically bank B will send some small transaction to bank uh, A to prove, you know, that you know, once you provide that specific amount to prove that you own that account, you access that account, and you can provide that information. And of course, they're gonna do all of the uh, regular KYC checks. But of course, if you own that account, if you actually not own but uh, control that account, um, you can provide all of that uh, KYC information because you've, uh, you have access to the uh, identity information and you also control the uh, account in Bank A you can just open an account in bank B and move all of the money from uh, account A to account B. Uh, thing is that bank B is now responsible for uh, the fraud loss. Let's call deposit fraud and let's actually see someone opening an account. Um, they're pasting a lot of information. Um, in this case, they're pasting the uh, routing code, the account number, user ID, password. Uh, when they do the uh, actual uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, payment. Um, and then uh, the interesting thing here is, you know, all of this is happening uh, quite fast. And what you can see is they completed the funding. Now they uh, completed opening the account. Um, and uh, look at the analysis showing genuine users versus criminals. About 2% of on an account opening sessions will have this behavior where we see a paste from a different application. So essentially an alt tab to a different tab and then paste the information from that tab. Um, that's 2% of the users. For criminals, it's 25%. You know, this is pretty, you know, significant. So it's quite informative seeing that. At the same time, we also understand that we cannot really incriminate 2% of the population or, you know, we need more information because 25% is not gonna be a, a good detection rate if you want to detect those sort of uh, fraud cases. So in any case, that's like, you know, one type of analysis. Uh, obviously, you need much more than that. But deposit fraud is another type of uh, account opening fraud that uh, is skyrocketing these days. Um, so we talked about, you know, pacing information. We talked about, um, you know, typing information. Now let's look at the difference between good users and bad users. Um, criminals are going to type off a list. So if, you, if they choose not to uh, you know, populate the field automatically with some sort of bot or to use a uh, pasting, which you know, you've seen that it's only 25% of the cases, they will typically type off a list. They have a li list of victims. Um, thing is that short memory is limited to just seven characters or items. So think about someone typing a social security number that does not belong to them. It will be very mechanical, right? Um, so we see someone typing, uh, you know, the social security number, it takes them quite, uh, you know, like nine seconds to complete the SSN. Typically it's going to be, uh, something like uh, four seconds for an SSN. Um, date of birth, it's like, you know, two digits. I'm looking at the list. I'm going back. Okay. Another two digits. Uh, okay. I know the year it's, it's going to be 19 something. Okay. What's the number again, going to the list, going back. This is a very mechanical process. Typing off a list is something that you can also uh, understand uh, criminals uh, do. Um, they want to be efficient, they have a list, but essentially that's the way for them to, uh, you know, show the, the, the fact that they are not familiar with that information. It's not top of their mind. Um, as opposed to something that we're going to see right now, sometimes the neural customer checks actually conflict with the next generation analysis. There was a specific case with one of the big card companies that uh, essentially said, hey, we're gonna decline an application because it's definitely fraud. You know, 96% chance of something being fraud. But when we looked at the data, it was interesting. Um, the session timeline, uh, again, is all of the activities that the user is doing. And what you can see is that the social security number is typed continuously. And by the way, behavior biometric is not interested in the data itself. You're gonna see it's all, you know, one, one, ones. When we actually look at it again, the typing is quite confident. You know, you don't see the same thing like typing off a list. Certainly you don't see any pasting. It's not autofill. 
um, whoever is typing this information is quite familiar with the social security number, suggesting it's their own social security number. Long-term memory is a very strong inheritance field. The other interesting thing here, look at the timeline. Uh, there's a 58 second pause. Why? Because in this specific case, it's a hotel credit card. So in order to open the account, you need to provide your hotel loyalty number. You probably have some hotel loyalty numbers, but no one remembers them. And it takes you a minute or two to fetch them maybe from your inbox or something like that. Maybe it's in your wallet. Um, so about one minute is, is the norm. And we do see that this user also, you know, paused for about one minute to fetch that number and then continue with the application. This is a very, very positive sign, right? This person behaves like everyone else. Criminals are not going to bother with waiting for one minute because they need this information. They have this information. It's all ready for them. It's going to be right along, you know, the name, date of birth and social security number uh, because they need it to open the account. Uh, whereas, you know, real users, there's going to be some type of information that you're going to be very familiar with. It, it's etched in your long-term memory. But other types of information you have to research, you have to fetch. Um, and that's essentially analyzing the way a genuine user will behave. So what do we have here? We have here a kind of a conflict because um, the analysis suggests, the next generation analysis suggests that it's a good user, right? familiar with the social security number, behaves like everyone else. But the card company said, hey, that's bad. Um, we were actually curious about that. We asked the credit card company, hey, guys, what do you, you know, why do you think this is going to be a fraudulent application? They said, well, we like you very much, guys, but it has to be fraud because the guy is dead. He's been dead for 10 years. You know, we checked the social security number. It belongs to a dead person. Well, that was bad. Um, I mean, we were so sure that this is, a, you know, a, an actual genuine person. And, you know, we ask the issuer, can you actually call the user, you know, to try to find out what went on here? Because, you know, it looks lo so real, like it's a real genuine person. They said, they're dead. We're not going to call them. We had a bit of an argument and eventually they caved in and said, okay, we're going to call them. Let's see what happens. Um, so the fraud operations team now calls the user. It was a miracle. He picked up the phone. He was not dead. Um, ended up that he had a typo in the social security number. He just had a mistake. Let's see it again. You know, typed very confidently, but with a typo that the user did not realize. This actually matched to a totally different person. The name was wrong. The social security was <laughs> belonging to someone that died. Um, so sometimes the data is going to suggest that this is a bad application, but uh, some of the next generation analysis don't really care about the data. It cares about the way you behave. It cares about you know your device, your you know other uh, elements, and therefore uh, sometimes it's more trustworthy than actually you know looking at the data itself. Let's move to synthetic identity. And synthetic identity is a very interesting new problem uh, in the US, relatively new. It's, uh, it has been around for over a decade, but uh, it's becoming more and more of a problem. Um, this is from ID Analytics. And what you can see is, you know, social security belonging to, you know, one identity, uh, a name in, is invented or, you know, belonging to a different identity, date of birth, etc., etc. It's like combining a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a digital uh, identity that does not really belong to any specific person because it's a mashup of various identities. Um, now, then what do they do with this identity? Because that identity obviously cannot open a credit card, right? They don't have a, any kind of credit history. No, no one's going to give them a loan. So the idea is to create a synthetic identity and then through some collusion, with rogue lenders uh, begin to apply for loans and then build credit history by returning the loan. So it's reported as a positive thing. Another trick is to attach this identity to someone who has a perfect FICO score, like a credit card account order as a secondary uh, user in that account. That's another thing that you can do to essentially get the tenure of a good user. Um, so whether you uh, focus on building a credit history or just, you know, a very good tenure, um, the idea is to create this identity and then um, 
you know, create a credit history and, uh, you know, good credit for that person who does not exist, of course. And then launching your tech, you know, you, you, you know, just go to a, a credit card company, you open a credit card uh, account, you maybe apply for a loan, a mortgage even, uh, etc. Um, one in four synthetic identities are actually using child's social security numbers and the you know, trafficking in child social security number in the dark web has increased dramatically. Um, a lot of these are coming from healthcare breaches. Um, so that's a very interesting trend. And of course, not something that we want to see, you know, in the industry. Uh, the reaction of the industry was to start suspecting lots of people. Um, so let's actually see um, one example. We see someone who um, is 31 years old no driver's license, very thin credit history, and the social security was issued recently, just a few years ago. Obviously highly suspicious. They were asked to provide, you know, government records, tax records, and then they never submitted the records. So the transaction was canceled, the application was canceled. Let's see the way they applied. This is from an iPhone. So they're applying via an iPhone. They're providing right now their uh, email. Um, they're providing um, their birth. They had a typo in the date of birth, so they corrected it and just continued. But it, well, it's all natural and very confident. This is the phone number. Um, little pause before annual income. They kind of thought about it and then they provided the annual income and then went to uh, type the social security. And again, you can see it's all very natural, no pauses. This is not someone typing off a list, not someone pasting information. They're familiar with all of the personal uh, uh, data fields. Another interesting thing is they also looked at the rates and fees for 90 seconds before even starting the application. Now, if you kind of look at all of these together, this is not going to be a synthetic identity. This may be a suspect, but it looks like a genuine person. And when the credit uh, issuer, you know, that had this level of analysis uh, investigated further, what they found was it's an immigrant. It kind of explains everything. You know, the SSN and the, the thin file. Um, this is someone who works for a big tech firm in San Francisco uh, area. They're actually a great candidate, a great acquisition target. So, you know, uh, blaming them and pointing the finger and saying, hey, you, you, you're probably some sort of uh, synthetic identity. You have to prove yourself. Um, that was something that uh, almost killed that specific application. And of course, um, that's not what uh, banks and issuers would like to do. Um, let's see the opposite. Now let's see someone who is too familiar with the process. Uh, you know, before we saw someone that was not familiar, went to see the terms and conditions and stuff like that, but this is someone who is too familiar. Uh, income source, right? When you click on the income source, when you open an account, um, there's this window that says, okay, employed, retired, self-employed, unemployed, military, etc. It takes you maybe like four seconds, five seconds, to read through and say, okay, well, I'm employed, so let's click employed. Um, and then uh, if we look at a specific cyber grant, again, that was uh, attacking one of the banks, uh, it was less than a second. I mean, they, they knew what's uh, uh, going to happen. They have been there before. They are opening, you know, lots of accounts. So they're not uh, stuck on this uh, screen. They know what to select. It takes them less than a second to select something and then uh, proceed. This is someone too familiar uh, with the process. So if you think about all of the criminals, I mean, they have the data, um, they're attacking the same target, you know, again and again, because they know the specific controls in that specific target. Uh, they know they're not going to be uh, uh, caught. Uh, so therefore, they're going to be very familiar with the process. They're not, not going to be familiar with the data. Uh, and that's essentially what we uh, see here. Another interesting uh, trend is looking at the age of the user reflected in their behavior. Uh, and this is another uh, fascinating example. This specific user uh, applying for a credit card was born in 1918. You, you kind of uh, remember the year, right? Because World War I ended and also the Spanish flu, that was also 1918. Let's see someone who is over 100 years old applying for a credit card. So extremely rapid mouse motion, uh, extensive use of tab and mouse wheel, you know, this is not typical for someone who is over 100 years old. And of course, it's all around statistics and probabilities, but it's highly unlikely that this person is 
um, you know, such an elderly, uh, uh, you know, uh, citizen. Um, the bottom line is that when you look at uh, criminals and a lot of the behavior that they will display uh, is not going to be in line with genuine user, with the claimed age of the user uh, or the known age of the user, uh, etc. Um, another interesting uh, thing is the fact that sometimes even without seeing any of the data, uh, you do know that uh, something is wrong. Um, and this is called the curious ca case of the straw company. Um, let me explain. This is a straw company. Um, the name of the company we kind of changed. It's not the last straw, but um, it's a company based in San Diego. It uh, provides quality uh, paper straws. Uh, as you know, in California, you know, it's the law. You have to uh, provide your customers with paper straws. Um, so people can buy those uh, packs. If you're a restaurant, you buy a crate, you know, full of straws. Um, there was a sizable order of 62 crates, 740,000 straws, costing $15,000 plus $10,000 for urgent shipping to Tuvalu. What's Tuvalu? Welcome to Tuvalu. It's an island in the Pacific Ocean. 11,000 people, they don't need that many straws. So this is all curious. Um, however, in this specific case, even without knowing any of this data, you know, not the fact that it's a straw company, you know, selling straws, not the fact that it's a very big order, the number of straws, the payment for the straws, the, you know, $10,000 for the urgent shipping, you know, the location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, without seeing any of this data, you could know that this is fraud simply based on the way um, the information was provided. And again, let's see a quick video. This is uh, someone pasting the credit card number uh, and the uh, CVV2, uh, um, typing the expiration and pasting the postal code. Think about your postal code. Did you ever paste your postal code? It's easier to type your postal code, you know, your zip code, than to uh, type it, uh, the, the, you know, easier to uh, type it than to paste it. You know, people don't paste the, the, the zip code. Uh, in fact, when you look at the statistics, it's about 99.9% .9 of the users, they never paste the zip code. Um, this is, by the way, one small fact, but there are, you know, dozens of features, you know, around each of those uh, fields. Uh, another interesting thing about, uh, zip code is how fast you begin typing your zip code. Uh, because you're familiar with it, you have some muscle memory that immediately starts uh, you know, going into action and almost like automatically typing your zip code uh, if you uh, go through uh, some sort of online form. Um, bottom line is this person is not familiar with their own uh, zip code. Um, now, this was a curious case because you can say, okay, fine we shouldn't trust this transaction you know it looks very very suspicious but but why would a fraudster go through all of the trouble of buying 62 crates okay all of these straws and ship them urgently to tuvalu what's the point what are they trying to achieve i mean are they trying to you know take the goods and then sell them in tuvalu what for you know you, you might think of all sorts of uh, creative ideas i mean maybe they maybe they need the straws to buy some you know to to, to build some some huts or you know tuvalu is actually having uh, water level issues i mean the the the, sur you know, the surface uh uh water level is rising all the time maybe they need the straws for emergency or something no it wasn't something like that and um, the interesting thing about this specific fraud was the amount for the shipping ten thousand dollars the entire thing was built to inflate the amount it's an urgent shipping to the middle of the pacific ocean 62 crates it will have to cost a fortune so what actually happened here was the following uh, after making the payment go through right so you know using a corporate credit card uh one of the u.s uh, uh, banks um the you know uh, user called the merchant and said, hey, 
I have made a terrible mistake. I didn't realize it's so expensive. You know, ten thousand dollars. You know, your your shipping company is crazy. They they, they charge ten thousand dollars for this. I have another shipping company that I prefer using, and they only charge two thousand dollars. Can you do me a favor? Because I already paid you ten thousand dollars. Can you move ten thousand dollars to that shipping company, and then they'll use it for this shipping and then additional shipping that I'll have in the future? You know, like like crediting me. Um, and the merchant said, are you sure? I mean, there's lots of crates here. Yeah, they're fantastic. We work with them all the time. They're very cheap. You should, you know, use them for all of your shipping. Um, and of course, it wasn't a real, uh, you know, shipping company. It was an account created or opened by the criminal. The bottom line is, uh, when you think about account opening, you know, even e-commerce fraud, any kind of case and scenario where you have a new user, you don't have any kind of uh, profile on the user, prior behavior to look at, uh, transaction monitoring to look at, and things like that. Um, you know that KYC is dead, but you do have more and more capabilities, device, reputation, location analysis, uh, this sort of analysis called behavior biometrics to um, tell you, hey, something is either very good about this or something is terribly wrong uh, about this. Another interesting uh, thing to note is that the AO fraud is really changing the ecosystem. Um, this is from uh, California. Um, there was a new digital bank that was opened. And when you actually look at the number of uh, new users on a daily basis, you know, it's around 100 uh, people uh, on a daily basis. And all of a sudden, it jumped to about 700 people. So this is crazy. I mean, they said, hey, finally the marketing team is doing something. No, they're not. It's an attack. You have 100 good users and 600 bad users every day. Okay? And essentially the bank did have device reputation and email reputation, uh, meaning, you know, what do we know about this email and how does it relate to the device and the phone and other elements? This was allowing them to stop about 50% of the attack, but there were still 300 people, okay, that were registering every day, as opposed to something like 100 good users. This is not sustainable. The bank will have to either, you know, stop receiving new customers or allow them in, but then don't allow them to make, you know, any kind of money transfers or move money out until they sort out, you know, who's a good user and who's a bad user. And that's difficult because the criminals will know everything about the good users. Um, initially, when I looked at that, I thought that it may be like a bot that is opening all of these accounts. No, it wasn't. It was a human being. And in fact, it was a specific person that was opening all of these hundreds of accounts. They were doing it very mechanically. They were very familiar with the onboarding process. They were totally unfamiliar with the, with the data. Okay, short term memory, typing mechanically, working off a list. They're not pasting any information. They were just typing all, you know, all day long. Um, so that's essentially one of the risks that uh, banks and uh, fintech companies are facing these days. Whenever you launch a new digital product and you just open it to you know, the entire world to register, if you don't have the right uh, capabilities to detect those sort of attacks, you can go down. You, you, you can really suffer from a massive campaign like this, not a bot campaign, not a DDoS attack, nothing like that. Just, you know, opening a lot of fake accounts that belong to real people, uh, not synthetic identities even, it's just identity theft because the data is there. And then it's gonna be very, very, uh, you know, pro problematic to handle this situation. So new digital banks, you know, good luck with that. Uh, make sure that you have these sort of uh, defenses in place. Another impact of account opening fraud on the economy is a new uh, service in the US called Zelle. And I'm sure most of you know Zelle. It's a great service. It allows you to pay from your uh, account. Um, you know, I, I think that in the UK you'll have similar, uh, similar types of uh, uh, money, motion, money movement uh, capabilities. You basically can uh, send money to anyone in your contact list. Uh, you can send my, uh, money uh, to an email account, you know, things like that. Uh, this is in the US and, and because of the ease of account opening and the ease of compromising email accounts, uh, the whole Zelle industry uh, is, 
is, is essentially shaking because this is, you know, a single story, but it kind of reflects the, the under, you know, underlying problem of the whole uh, system. So in this case, Frost has randomly compromised the business owner's email account, right? So just a regular, you know, Gmail, Yahoo, whatever sort of a, a account belonging to a, a person. Um, they saw that this person was interacting with the renters of their property uh, and saying, hey, if you want to move money, why don't you use Zelle? You can, you, can, you can send me the rent money using Zelle. So what the criminal did was open a fake account, okay? Using the same uh, uh, information uh, at uh, a top five bank and then enrolling for Zelle at that bank using the compromised email. Now the thing is that once you use uh, the email of the user, that new bank account is now attached to that email. Right, the bank will obviously uh, send something to the email, uh, like a one-time code that you have to repeat. So it basically proves that you control that email. But if that email is compromised, okay, this check doesn't mean anything. So essentially, you know, beating the KYC checks and then beating the uh, email uh, email uh, 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 check of uh, a new uh, registration, um, attaching that new bank account to that email. And the bank said, okay, but this email address is already linked to another account at another bank. Do you want to change it to our bank? And the Froster says, yeah. Uh, and the bank simply enrolled the Froster in Zelle, you know, because now this email account, um, you know, basically is attached to this uh, a new account. Um, and ba basically at that point, it's a uh, game over because any Money, any money movement that will go to this email account will automatically go to the Frost's new account at this uh, uh, top five bank. All right, so the renters send the money to the Zelle email address as normal, but now going to a newly open account controlled by the criminal rather than the real user. Game over. So essentially, um, the fact that account opening uh, software was not top priority for uh, banks, credit card companies, etc. Um, it's changing the industry, right? You have all of these uh, cases. It, it doesn't have to be fraud. It can also be money laundering. It can be mule accounts. Let's actually talk about mules because um, there is an implication of a high account opening fraud world. Um, this is like a, a diagram, a very crude one, showing um, you know a typical uh, fraud supply chain. Uh, obviously, it's not a single person that can do everything. Uh, as a fraudster, you typically choose uh, between, you know, am I going to harvest information, you know, break into uh, accounts and uh, break into databases or you know, do phishing, trojans, etc., collect the information, or am I going to use that stolen information to cash out? You know, typically people make that choice. Um, you know, the harvesting process would use tools and hosting and delivery mechanisms to you know, infect more people or send them phishing emails and stuff like that, or just break into a, a database. Uh, the cash out fraudsters will be the ones that are tasked with emptying all of these accounts. They understand everything about the specific bank defenses, the credit card defenses. Uh, they know how to move money. They know what sort of controls are in place. And they also need to send the money, obviously not to themselves, but to some sort of collaboration a account uh, and for many years those were mule accounts because it was very difficult to open an account uh, let's say locally if you're a criminal outside of the UK to use an account in the UK if you're outside of the US to use an account in the US so you always recruited local collaborators some of them knowingly some of them unknowingly um, I mean in Australia for example there was a case where um, the uh, criminals went to uh, high schools and said, hey, you have like a, like a teenager account. Uh, we are uh, kind of a charity uh, company, uh, char charity, you know, big charity and don donors, uh, people that have, you know, lots of money will, uh, you know, send money to your account. Um, you're going to pass it to us. We're the charity in uh, East Europe and you're going to get a commission. So. The, the, the teenagers didn't really realize they're actually collaborating with this sort of uh, uh, scheme. 
So sometimes the mules know that they're mules, sometimes they don't know that they're mules, they're being recruited. Um, mules have been a, 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 you know, a very important part of that ecosystem. But now you don't need them. You can be your own mule. You can just open an account online. It's so easy these days and just send money you know, from your compromised account to your newly established account, saving the need to uh, work with mules. Uh, it's saving you a lot of money. Opening an account is free. You don't have to pay anyone. And once the money is in your new account, you can just you know, do whatever you want with it. You can send it anywhere. You can buy things, whatever. So this is changing a lot of the uh, you know, economics of uh, online fraud. All right, so let's actually summarize. Um, what have we learned today? Identity is totally broken. Criminals behave differently. And when in doubt, call the dead guy. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and let's see if you have any questions.